Hi, I'm Haley Wooden, and I'm pleased to present my documentary, Breaking the Bond. This film looks at the impact New York City's Administration for Children's Services has had on families, in particular, families of color. This is told through the story of one mother, and you'll meet her in a moment. The film also looks at the work being done by parents, advocates, and attorneys to fix problems in the child welfare system, referred to by many as the family regulation system. This documentary is about family, family rights, change, and second chances. Thanks for watching. my stars right there. My rights were violated January 1st after I gave birth to my beautiful baby girl. A social worker comes to my room and stated how she see in their system that I had a ACS case 10 years ago. She basically told me she was going to get ACS involved. AJ and I was supposed to be discharged January 3rd. They was never supposed to hold AJ in that hospital when it was time to discharge until they got the court order, but they held her. So I refused to leave the hospital without her. January 5th is when we saw the judge via Zoom and the judge remand my daughter and 48 hours later took her to her foster mother. If there was a safety concern, there would have been somebody there to watch. No one was there. I think that regardless of how long ago that case was, my name is going to be red flagged here in New York. I want my daughter. <laughs> the child welfare system is an over-policing and an over-controlling of poor families. In New York City, that means there, there are certain communities, um, there are the same communities that are over-policed by the NYPD. There are the same communities where there's housing instability. It's the same communities that are impacted and over-policed at their very core and fundamental level, which is their family. There's been a lot of conversation about the racist nature of the criminal justice system. That's something that lots of people know about. You don't have to work in the criminal justice system to know about that. I find that with the child welfare system, unless you're in this system, unless you work in it, you don't know anything about it. I grew up in a very abusive household. And then I was sexually abused on top of that. Then I was a runaway. And then I was in a forced to care myself. I had my firstborn at the age of 16. I mentally was not in the right form to take care of them and myself. Yes, I did neglect my children. Or I was not the mother to them as I should have been. The mother that they deserve. The mother that I deserve. The mother that all children deserves. I wasn't that person. So at that time in 2012, no, I'm, I could not be a mother. That was 10 years ago. People change. People learn. I'm going to make mistakes here and there, but not to the point where it's going to hurt my children. Today, ACS might close your investigation, but if in two years there's an investigation because there was an argument between two parents, I guarantee that ACS will look back at the old investigation and they'll see that they themselves, no one else, but they mentioned there was a concern and that will come up in the new investigation. They, they almost use their own evidence as fact, um, so, or their own kind of collection of information as fact. 
So absolutely, it's something we see in future investigations. I see her three times a week for two hours, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. The agency is literally two hours away in a different borough. My daughter is residing in a different borough. Round trip, that would be four hour trip for a two hour visit. I would like to see her every day, all day, all night. In order to increase time, the ACS attorney for child have to agree to it. And if she doesn't, then my lawyer will have to put in a petition and leave it up to the judge to make the decision. I've been in Brooklyn the majority of my life until the pandemic. I'm a CNA traveling nurse. I had the opportunity to go to Hawaii. I became pregnant. It was a high-risk pregnancy. I decided to come to New York and get more help. I don't know how long I'm going to be stuck here dealing with ACS. I was supposed to have a fact-finding trial April 13. Now it's pushed back to June. I'm giving up my place in Hon Honolulu, Hawaii, and I'm staying in a family shelter until I can get my daughter back. So, this is my unit. When you first enter, it's the kitchen. But I have bottles, bottle warmer. I bought car seat, stroller, bassinet, playpen, crib, baby tub, bottles, you name it, even formula during my third trimester. It's still in my possession. It's still in my room. And I still see it every day, every night. She has grown out of about 70% of the clothes I bought. And she hasn't even worn some of it. They still have tags on it. I've planned and was prepared throughout this whole pregnancy and ACS took the first part of motherhood away from me. This is normally the behavior of the Administration for Children's Services, better known as ACS. They are an abusive, traumatic, hindering agency. They hinder you from happiness and mental well-being by traumatizing your family relentlessly with impunity. Today we had a community town hall in Brownsville, Brooklyn, hoping to bring the community out to educate them on their rights around ACS and make them aware that they are not in this struggle alone. Oftentimes people go into what's like a cocoon, believing it's only happening to them and hiding in shame and not letting people, even their own family members sometimes, know what's happening with them. Well, I'll share from this one. It says, what does abolition of ACS look like to you? And I drew this building of ACS. What resonates with me is that I was deceptively placed into detention where the outcome for my children is not better, but it's actually worse. We're working on Miranda, Know Your Rights legislation to have it become a law in New York. We're working with city council as well as a state piece of legislation. Me knowing my rights has nothing to do with a child being safe because if you're doing things that are not violating my rights, you would still get to verify the safety of a child. Miranda refers to a Supreme Court decision in which the Supreme Court held that someone who's facing criminal allegations has the right to be told what their rights are. When we talk about family Miranda rights, it's really all of the rights that already exist in the law. I kind of believe they don't follow you um, around and only apply if you're being approached by a police officer, as we think about it. They're rights we have um, in relation to the state. Very simply put, 
the legislation would require a investigative caseworker to tell a parent or caretaker to inform them of, of these rights that are enumerated in, clearly in the legislation at the onset of the investigation. I believe families have the right to know why AC is at the door. What are, what are, what's the report? What are the allegations? What's the safety concern? People also have the right to know that they could speak to an attorney before they answer any of those questions. They have the right to know that um, they don't have to let that person into their home, that that person could go get a warrant or an or a court order. It kills me that my newborn for the past three months has been taking care of somebody else and I am missing that part of her life. I wanted that. And that was taken away from me. I'm pretty much doing the waiting game. I've done everything the judge has asked me to do and more. Anger management completed it and parenting skills completed it. I don't know what more I can do to show I'm not that girl 10 years ago. For June 8th, I'm just leaving it up to God. I can't focus on that right now. My time is just to enjoy my visits with my daughter as much as I can. When the government tries to remove a child from a parent, um, the parent is playing defense in that court proceeding. They're trying to stop the removal in the first place, and if there is a removal, they're trying to get their child home as quickly as possible. But if ACS did something illegal, family court has no power to hold ACS accountable. That is what caused the creation of the Family Justice Law Center. It launched a couple weeks ago. It's the first organization in the country dedicated to bringing lawsuits against government entities and government actors uh, when they violate families' rights uh, connected to the child welfare system. Family separation is a civil rights issue. And not just a civil rights issue, but one of the most important civil rights issues of our time. The plan is to get my daughter back and then go back home, and home is Honolulu, Hawaii. It's time to go home. Hi there, my name is Brendan McInerney. I, along with my filmmaking partner, Sanjay Silva, have created the film you're about to watch, Criminal Intelligence. We hope you'll enjoy. In the beginning, the entire city's a blind spot. So you put one camera up, you know, you carefully put that one camera up to only fight terror in this one tourist zone where there once was an attack. And then there's a crime somewhere. There's a crisis somewhere, and it's in the blind spot. There's always gonna be a spot where there's no camera, but no one says, show us that everything's safer now. Whether it's because you're queer, or whether it's because you're trans, or whether it's because you know, you're black. Criminalized identities. People are like, this person's up to no good, and if I can't find the bad, I'm not looking deep enough, and I'm gonna keep digging and keep looking. And with enough heightened attention in one area, you're probably gonna find something. Just a picture changed everything. We could be having this conversation for me from Rollway State Prison in Trenton somewhere right now, doing 20 years. So it's just like, that's the big difference right there, being free and being not free. On January 26th, 2019, a man using the alias Jamal Owens entered a Hampton Inn in Woodbridge, New Jersey, and took snacks from the snack bar. Without confronting Mr. Owens, the hotel manager called the police. 
When they arrived, they attempted to arrest Mr. Owens because he presented a fake ID. The Woodbridge Police Department found tons of evidence related to this case. They found fingerprints, DNA, the car he was driving, the rental agreement he had signed, as well as a number of personal items. All of this evidence would have led them to Mr. Owens. But instead, the Woodbridge Police Department relied exclusively on a facial recognition match that identified Niger Parks. Officers from the Woodbridge Police Department took the image in the fake ID given to them by Jamal Owens and sent it to a fusion center, a place where intelligence is gathered and shared with other law enforcement agencies. It was here that the image was digitally manipulated and put into facial recognition software. That software identified Niger Parks as the person in the photograph. Niger was arrested and incarcerated more than 15 years ago. It is for this reason that his mugshot is kept in a facial recognition database. Now, in addition to working full-time and raising two children of his own, Niger coaches basketball. The same team that I'm coaching is the same team I played for. This is about my 10th year now. It's a family league. Every, most kids in the league, their father played in this league. Most kids, their father took them to play for the team that they played for. Isaiah. Yeah. 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 Pretty boy, not going in first. Look at your face. It's not over yet. It's not over yet. Relax. Good job. Good job. Good job. Line up. Line up. Line up. I had her since she was six. That's right. That's my nice. baby. Congratulations. That's what he is. Uh -huh. okay? As Niger deals with the aftermath of his arrest by the Woodbridge police in his own city, Patterson, the police department is developing a program called Eyes on Patterson, which will allow them to access private security cameras in real time. Hello, this is Father Lewis Skirty with Friends of the Word. Today, my very special guest is a, a friend who's been a friend for many years, Jerry Spezial, who is presently the police director of Patterson, New Jersey. Welcome, Jerry. Good to see you, Father. Thank How you for you? coming. Oh, great to be here. Th th that's fascinating, the, the fact that a police director uh, talks about bringing technology into crime prevention. Um, um, talk about some of that technology. You go on our website, when you click on the eyes on Patterson, you download all your information so that we can take your exterior cameras from your building or your home, mm -hmm. and then we can put it into the police camera room where police officers are monitoring right. it. And we can also have a patrol car could view it on their mobile data computer. That's amazing. I I'm so impressed with that. And, and to keep ahead with technology is, sure. oh my goodness, a, a great uh, a gift almost. I mean, we're in the age of technology. Sure. And like, how are programs like Eyes on Patterson the same as a dangerous, obvious, we should stay away from surveillance system? It is not easy to see that they are literally one and the same. It's like a wolf in sheep's clothing. Anything that's captured and held can be turned into a matching system to find you and connect you with someone. There's raw footage of you, and then there's also raw footage that's gonna be put through a computer that can use its artificial intelligence to, to take a, your face and run it against other faces. But it's really bad at matching black and brown faces. It's really bad at matching women's faces. But you're gonna have a, a higher frequency of contact with this technology and therefore, there's a higher chance of you getting caught up in a misidentification. Niger's case was filed years ago, but because of administrative delays, being moved from one court to another, being reassigned to another judge, obstruction by the Woodbridge Police Department, he still has not had his day in court. When he does, he will be suing for wrongful arrest, wrongful imprisonment, 
and breaches of his human rights. My aunt used to always say, you don't have to be doing anything to get in trouble. And we used to always, oh, police ain't, ain't bothering me, I ain't even doing nothing. They can't, they can't do this if I ain't do nothing. They can't do that if I ain't do nothing. And now I know they can do whatever they want. And there's nothing nobody can do about it. Surveillance isn't, I sent an electronic email and someone intercepted it and read it. That's not surveillance. Yeah, that's how it might look now in this present moment. And once you understand what it was, and then you already know what it is now, you can see what it will be. The poison in the water in Flint, at least you could see what's happening, right? This is like a slow killer. It's like, you know, because generationally strangle you. So if we could stop this here, then we could stop it before it gets to wherever you're at. Because this is the Petri dish. This is the beta land. This is the test for what's going to roll out across this entire country. is doc screening with our lovely audience. Oh yeah. Hey folks, thanks for coming. For those of you who don't know, I'm CJ Walker. And I'm Nellie Given. And this is our movie, Baby, Baby Bust. Bust. <laughs> we went on quite the journey making this film, didn't we, Nels? Yes, we did. Now we hope that you will go on the journey too with us by watching. Enjoy. Thank you. And changing weather, inflation, and rising costs. Yeah. Rents have been climbing. The state of this country may be influencing a record number of Americans against having children. According to the UN, global birth rates are falling so fast that in two generations, the human population will decrease for the first time in history. In the United States, birth rates have hit their lowest numbers since the Great Depression. The main drivers behind this trend are millennials and Gen Z, who are choosing to have fewer or no children. While this is good news for the environment, it will have dire consequences for future GDP growth and care for the elderly. So, how did we get here? Before industrialization, the human population was relatively stable. Birth rates, also called fertility rates, the average number of children a woman has during her lifetime, were also stable. In pre-industrial America, over half the population lived in rural areas and had high birth and death rates. But industrialization saw a huge spike in birth rates, and better medicine meant people lived longer. Birth rates usually follow the economy. A good economy means more births, a bad economy fewer births. The Great Depression saw fewer babies born. Then. During World War II, with most men overseas, women joined the workforce in unprecedented numbers. When men came back from the war, women were encouraged to return to their role of managing the household and raising children. In a booming post-war economy, fertility rates in the U.S. skyrocketed, with around 4.24 million babies being born from 1946 to 1964, the generation known as the baby boomers. But women's brief time in the workforce made them begin to question their traditional role as homemaker. Women's liberation, the unfinished revolution of American women. The wider availability of contraceptives, alongside the second wave of feminism, and the federal legalization of abortion with Roe v. Wade allowed women to take more control over their lives. At the same time, the early 1970s saw back-to-back -back economic recessions, which drove birth rates down even further. But in the healthy economy of the 1980s and 1990s, U.S. birth rates bounced back, slightly. The Great Recession of 2008, however, saw a huge drop in fertility. But even as the economy got better, birth rates continued to fall. Nearly 2.3 million fewer babies were born in the U.S. between 2008 and 2013, a 9% drop. It was the first time that the U.S. fertility rate dropped below 2.1 births per woman replacement level fertility. Birth rates plummeted again during the COVID-19 pandemic, 
reaching its lowest point in three decades, with no sign of stopping. Social distancing has prevented people from meeting and potentially having children together. A baby boom that some doctors and, for that matter, comedians expected is actually turning out to be a major baby bust. A baby bust. Baby bust. Pandemic baby bust, maybe. The U.S. fertility rate is now around 1.64 meaning the next generation of Americans will be much smaller than their parents' generation. So why are millennials and Gen Z having fewer babies? While there are many causes, the ones most cited are changing social norms, more women joining the workforce, financial instability, and fears over climate change. I definitely see this as like the era to be selfish and the era to like make decisions purely for myself and in my best interest. Um, and so having kids then is very far away on my mind. For me, yeah, kids are a part of my vision for the future. Uh, not anytime soon, but I definitely want to have a family. I love the idea of having four kids. I'm one of four children, so I had a wonderful upbringing, and I think that's just the best number. <laughs> when I think of the future, I think of the fact that I just recently started transitioning. I've been on hormone replacement therapy for seven weeks now. It's complicated. I'd like to have kids one day, maybe, but there's also so much that I would much rather do. I guess sometimes I feel like I have an obligation to have children because I'm a woman of color. What role do I like, am I supposed to play in this? Especially because I feel like a rising demographic of people not having kids are black women because we're finally realizing our worth and like, you know, seeking careers and stuff like that. Historically, women have faced pressure to have children by a certain age. Today, the average age of first time mothers is increasing. In the United States, there's been an uptake in the number of women becoming mothers between the ages of 40 and 44. At the same time, birth rates among women aged 34 and younger have steadily declined over the past three decades. While more women are having babies later, or not at all, women still face pressure from friends, family, and society to reproduce. Many women face the question, will I regret my decision after it's too late? I think each community, each sub-community, pressures its own people in a more direct way. What's happening is that people have anxieties about options and choices, and they want to believe that Whatever it is that they were told is the norm, and they chose, and it's a choice, to walk with is the only choice, because multiplicity is anxiety-provoking. The word decide comes from a Latin root meaning to cut away from. So every decision involves loss. So when people are criticizing themselves or their partner, if they have one, you know, why can't we just make this decision you know, and go forward with our lives? Whatever you decide, you give up all the joys of the other thing. And people think, well, it's not the right decision unless I'm 100% sure. But it's the nature of human beings to be ambivalent. And the capacity to be aware that we're losing something by making a choice and dealing with it is a real strength. I want to be like in the workforce. I want to have my own career. And I want to be goal-oriented. And I don't want to live my life around kids, but now in hindsight, I'm realizing that my mom's ability to be a stay-at-home mom is a privilege that I probably won't have in the way that she had. Um, I'm like, I don't want anybody telling me what I can and can't do. I'm like, I want to make that decision for myself. And the fact that women who do take off time have a harder time getting back into the field and back into their careers, like, I don't think that's right. And it's making me want to, like, change the system and like prove that that's not, that doesn't have to be the way it is. And In the last five years, nearly half of all mothers in the U.S. had to take 12 weeks or more time off of work within the first two years of motherhood. But a quarter of the women who took time off work after giving birth claimed that it had a negative effect on their careers. Some moms across America have found a way to let off a little steam, no kids allowed. ranging from being passed over for promotions to experiencing discrimination from coworkers. Women saying, um, I would have a child if I could be a dad instead of a mom. I want to do 50% of the, ch the child care and housework, not 80%.
Um, women are worried about losing their identity. The U.S. is famous for not having, <laughs> not being supportive of families through public policy. Over the past 50 years, the amount of working moms in the U.S. has increased from 51 to 72 percent. The United States, one of the richest countries in the world, is one of the only countries across the globe that doesn't offer federally mandated paid parental leave. Think about it like I don't necessarily not want kids. It's just like I want to accomplish so much in my career and so much for myself that like I don't see where I would have the time to incorporate a child. I feel like even on my own, like I don't live a stable life and I can't, I don't foresee that changing anytime soon. But finding a one bedroom apartment is already super difficult in the major cities. Finding a two bedroom, like the career I'm looking for will never pay me enough to afford that. Plus then you get all the other things, schools and supplies and food and clothing and sports and hobbies and they want to play the cello and that's, they lose the cello on the bus. The older I'm getting, the more that I understand that debt is just a part of life. So the idea of not being financially stable does freak me out a little bit, but at the same time, I don't, I don't think that'll deter me when the time does come. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, women earn 84% of what men earn in the workforce. However, 41% of mothers are the primary breadwinners of their families. In nearly two-thirds of two-parent families, both parents work, but caregiving duties still fall primarily on mothers. But mostly what we hear about are, you know, things like crushing student loan debt, you know, or medical debt, or they're not able to afford childcare, not able to afford elder care, you know, or struggling to pay rent, for example. There's a lot of like deep anxiety in me about what my future will look like with climate change. Um, I don't regret that I exist, obviously. However, there are so many things that have been outside of my parents' control. Climate change is definitely a concern. I don't feel that the current human lifestyle is sustainable long term. I am concerned because I don't necessarily think that my children's lives will be, you know, impacted that much. But like, what about my grandchildren? What about my great grandchildren? Three quarters of millennials and Gen Z claim that climate change is a top concern, while less than 30% of their parents and grandparents think it's a priority. Welcome to the stream. Would you decide not to have children to save the planet? That is the tough choice many people are considering as the global climate worsens. Life or death, is that how you see it? You know, those, those words are really scary, but yes, it is how I see it. You know, as you said, the UN has told us we have 10 years to basically turn our entire economic and political systems around um, and what's at stake is really human survival. I have been really concerned for a long time about global population and the impact that that has on climate change but also the impact it has just environmentally broadly. I knew a few people who were having this conversation about having fewer kids because of climate change or environmental reasons. And I would say in the last few years, it has become a conversation that comes up regularly. So lower birth rates are great for the environment, young people's financial stability, and women's participation in the workforce. But what are the downsides to having fewer babies? I don't see myself being in a position where I can be taken care of when I'm old. I just see myself working until I drop dead, and that's not by choice. In the U.S., adults are working past retirement age, with over 20% of those aged 65 and older working or looking for work. More older adults are choosing to age in place rather than move into assisted living facilities. In order to age in place, seniors need caregivers, often members of their family, mainly their children. So people without children are asking themselves, Who's going to take care of me when I'm old? 
So Population Connection is a national nonprofit organization based in Washington, D.C. It's been around since 1968. Um, and the mission of the organization is to stabilize the human population at a level that can be um, supported by the Earth's natural resources for future generations. When Social Security was invented back in the 30s, the average life expectancy beyond retirement age, so like the number of years people were expected to live after retirement was like two. And now, you know, it's 15 years that people are living beyond retirement. Um, so does that mean that we need to restructure some of these programs and policies that we have had in place for almost 100 years, you know? Maybe so. They want us to have as many babies as possible. Um, you know, Paul Ryan actually came out and said this, you know, when he was still Speaker of the House. Baby boomers are retiring. I did my part, but, but you know, we need to have higher birth rates in this country, meaning baby boomers are retiring and we have fewer people following them in the workforce. So, you know, of course, the obvious answer would just be like tax the rich then. But instead, what these politicians are doing is saying like, oh, we'll just have more kids because what they really want is just more taxpayers. I mean, the big concern, I'd say, is with population aging. It's begun, but it hasn't reached full flower anywhere. We have no experience on which to, uh, to base a prediction about this. If a population grows more slowly, then so does GDP. Once this process starts, a kind of downward economic spiral begins. Japan has one of the oldest populations on Earth, with an average age of 49. Only 17% of the population is made up of people under 20. Backwards. You know, once you p society decides to have less children, they don't tend to then go back to having more later. Some people would look at Japan's experience in the 1990s. Mm -hmm. Japan's the earliest really deeply aging country, and it got stuck in this situation with very low interest rates, very stagnant economy, and so on. In the next... Uh, 40, 50 years, it's going to get like two thirds again older than it is now. And even once we have what Japan looks like, we're not going to know for quite a while what it will look like if the whole world is old. You know, I think we would we would say that this is a human caused challenge and humans can meet the challenge, whereas the, the planet being finite is not something that we really have much control over. So far, millennials and Gen Z in the U.S. have had more social freedom to choose whether or not to have children than previous generations. However, with the potential overturning of Roe v. Wade coming this summer, soon young people in certain parts of the U.S. may have their power to choose taken away. I think that's so messed up. I mean, people are never going to stop getting abortions. So to me, it's just so counterintuitive. It's just, it's a means of control and it's not actually for the sometimes they're medically necessary sometimes they're emotionally and psychologically necessary it's tiring to even speak about like i should not have to explain this to a room full of white men ever on may 2nd politico released a leaked decision by the united states supreme court that will overturn roe v wade this summer States have passed legislation that will restrict abortion access as soon as the ruling is officially overturned. These trigger bans are currently in effect in 13 states. Even though more young people want smaller families, overturning Roe v. Wade will create one more barrier to their reproductive freedom. People who have means will always be able to travel out of state, just like before Roe v. Wade, people of means were able to travel outside of the country um, for safe abortions. Um, but people who don't have the money to do that um, or don't have flexible job schedules that will allow them to travel for a medical procedure, um, will, you know, will be faced with some difficult decisions as to whether they try to procure an unsafe abortion, you know, or whether, whether they'll carry an unwanted pregnancy to term. It can be very disheartening to see, you know, like these backward steps, but a lot of that is just how movements are. We still believe in the power of us, you know, to mobilize, to fight back, and change things. In times of like political system breakdown, people start to get really creative with their politics. And I think in many ways, they have to ask themselves fundamentally, like what power do I have as a body? 
Like I can choose to not have a child for myself. I can choose to not have a child for the climate crisis. I can choose to not have a child because of the moral impacts or the ethical impacts it will have on other beings. I can choose that. Of course. You ready? All right. But we have gained more and more freedom, and we've come so far. Okay, cool. <laughs> And this is Joss, and we made a film about how NFTs are changing the conventions of the traditional art world. To give you guys a better glimpse at the personal level, we found an artist, Amadi, who has found a lot of success in his NFT art, and he is still looking for that same level of success in the gallery world. We hope you enjoy. As much as we do. Two weeks went by, I had an offer. And I was just like, what? Like, oh shit, somebody like actually wanted it. They offered like, first I got an offer for like 300, if I'm not mistaken. And then immediately I got an offer for $500. I was like, whoa, well, $500, I just accepted it. And that was my first one that sold. The recent ones that I sold was 16,000. Completely changed my life. It's a wild, potentially lucrative marketplace. Why? Would anyone pay $69 million for a JPEG and a hyperlink? NFT stands for non-fungible token. Now, in economics, fungible means you can trade one identical unit for another. Think a, a dollar bill, gold, oil, or Bitcoin. Non-fungible means it's unique. It can't be replaced. Is it hyper-actual substance? Could the next Picasso or Van Gogh come from a digital creator? To understand how we got here, we first have to look back on the way that the art world has historically operated. Most fine artists hold an art degree, 
often coming from backgrounds that could financially sustain a career in the arts. Galleries operated as a place to connect artists and collectors, and acted as a third party to facilitate these transactions. In exchange, curators or gallerists often receive up to 60% of sales commission. The traditional fine art world has been an industry that has been highly gatekept from all aspects in terms of like artists, dealers, curators, everyone that interacts within this space. It's very, very gatekept and it's very difficult to penetrate and enter it. In 2008, Bitcoin emerged as an alternative to currency regulated by centralized banks. Every transaction involving Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies exists on the blockchain. Non-fungible tokens are digital receipts on the Ethereum blockchain. Just as cryptocurrencies have created a parallel economy, NFTs have created an alternative to the traditional art world. It's important to realize that most assets are digital already. So if you own stocks and bonds, there is a digital record of that that is kept somewhere on Wall Street. Um, the NFTs that have become very valuable are the ones associated with digital art, but I would expect in the longer term there's going to be more NFTs for very mundane business purposes than for um, wildly creative art. The older generations, including my generation, you know, 50s and 60s and 70s, they want the phys physical experience and the physical asset. They feel like that equals something. But the digital asset is even ruling their lives more than they realize, right? Everybody has multiple devices. Everybody is communicating digitally now. They're banking digitally. They're collecting digitally. They're gaming digitally. Um, so the value proposition for, for the younger generation and future generations as it relates to digital items and assets is going to be superior eventually. I saw this um, blockchain system as really a um, system of autonomy uh, and control for artists. That the artworks would start from them, from their studio, uh, and emanate out from there. Nearly 41 billion U.S. dollars worth of crypto was spent in the NFT marketplaces in 2021 alone. As NFTs became more mainstream, Traditional art institutions have begun to move into Web3, which is a new iteration of the internet based on blockchain technology. Case Verso is our Web3 platform in which we have been engaging with NFT projects. I do think specifically the reason why a lot of artists don't come to us in a lot of cases is because they feel like Verso ultimately is a voice within the space that has some form of authority and has um, some form of curatorial lens within the space that's very much needed. Now you've seen all of these artists come into this industry and utilize this technology quite literally for the advancement of their practice. Um, and with that, you know, it's interesting to see conversations more so now starting to shift specifically from like monetary value to cultural value. Um, that needle has been very, very slow. Most people that are closed-minded or narrowly focused um, categorize it as a simple JPEG or might say that this medium of artistic expression is not as valuable as a canvas or you know, a statue made of stone or gold or something like this, but it's absurd. Why is a physical Birkin bag worth so much money? You could buy a bag that's utility driven from Target, but we could create that same type of value proposition system, the issues of covetability and desire, wants, with Web3 application too. We really look at um, technology as this next generation's canvas. One such artist breaking into the NFT art space is Amadi. Born in Harlem, he is a first-generation New Yorker from the Dominican Republic. Growing up, Amadi was always drawing, but didn't view art as a viable career path. I never walked inside a gallery. I would walk by them, but I just looked. I was like, well, that's not for me. So uh, the galleries that I knew were like street artists and stuff that's on the streets, and we admired that, but that's as far as it went. Mm-hmm.
Mm -hmm. My community success was having a city job with good benefits or becoming a drug dealer with quality drugs and good connects. After a year of working at FedEx and experiencing conflicts with management, Amadi left his position and started selling drugs, a gig that landed him in prison. During his sentence, he started drawing again and making watercolor paintings. Some of the other inmates were art collectors who committed white-collar crimes leading up to the 2008 financial crisis, and they were some of the first people to take his art seriously. After being released from prison, he was introduced to NFTs. So COVID happened. Um, I lost my weekend job. I was just like, damn, like I feel like like everybody else just feel like stuck. We don't know what's gonna happen next. I met this gentleman that um that loved my work. He always used to come from my work and he brought to my attention NFTs. He was like, You ever heard of NFTs? Um, you ever consider it? It was a perfect platform for my watercolor paintings that I had started in prison because I didn't know how to like frame them, I didn't have a, a market for it. So that was like a, an ideal situation for my watercolors. Like, okay, I could do something different from my oil paintings and my texture work. I could do watercolors and add some digital elements I've been experimenting with already. And that changed my life completely. While some people have gotten rich quick by investing in the right NFTs, the long-term value of these digital assets remains uncertain. We, within Web3, are in a similar space to where the internet was in the 90s, right? All of the things that we're seeing in the space, yeah, probably like a good 75% of it will maybe lose its value. I've never been in the wave of anything. I always feel like I've been behind. All my life I feel like I've been in catch-up. And for the first time ever in my life this past uh, year, I felt like I was caught up with the NFT and I caught the wave and I don't want to like fall behind to a point where I don't understand it and it's just not like, it just like left, I missed the boat. Hi, I'm Clara Sophia. Hi, I'm Bahar. Our film is about single moms in the New York City homeless shelter system who are struggling to find an apartment with their rental assistance vouchers. The moms that you see in the film represent the majority of the homeless population in New York City that is largely invisible. We hope you enjoy. We entered the shelter system when I was um, seven and a half months pregnant with Logan and did not have anywhere else to go. We were there 428 days. This is the, our kitchen, technically. This is what we use to heat up all our meals. And this is Logan. And he's my little teeny tiny butter. How old is Logan? 10 months. Because I could not afford to pay fifteen hundred dollars in rent by myself, um, I was let go from the job I had previously, and whatever job I would try to obtain while I was pregnant would turn me down because I was very, very pregnant. And it is now after lunch. Only oh, eleven months he's been standing lately, and Abby's having a break from online learning. Uh, that's her remote learning device. Um, not much else going, going on in here. This is all we have in here, these four walls. I was surprised to tell you. What is it? This is our new apartment. <laughs> that was the surprise! That was the surprise! Thanks! Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. Do you like it, Abby? Do you yeah. like it, Abby? Yeah. Yeah. It has, it has a perfect kitchen. It has a kitchen. We can stay here! 
Yeah, we can stay here. I never we can want stay to here. I never want to leave this place. People don't understand. We're not there for fun. It's, it's not cute to be in a shelter. Um, when I first got a shelter, I was so shameful. I was like, oh my God, I'm really in a shelter. I cannot believe it. People don't want to be at shelters. When you're a single mom and you have your kid, you want the best for your kid. You don't want to sleep on a subway station. You don't want to sleep in a park. You don't want to sleep in a McDonald's. You don't want to sleep in no 24-hour Walmart area. You want to sleep in a nice place and get a proper bath for you and your kid. They determine whether or not you're eligible for a shelter placement. There are social workers or case managers who will interview you um, and do a history, understand how you became homeless, um, ask you about all of the alternatives to being homeless that you've investigated, check your income. It can take hours. And you have to go through a very complicated process of proving that you're homeless enough. Being a pregnant mom, you're tired, you're sleepy, but you have to also think about, do I wanna have this baby in shelter? A lot of babies are born into shelter. You'd be surprised, you just, it's not just moms coming in to shelter. People are being born into a system what's already not good for them. So in order to bathe him, so I would disinfect the sink. The water would come out orange. Could only resort to microwave meals. And that got very expensive. We had one microwave to share with 46 other families. Um, let's see. I guess let's see what we can find for breakfast here. Well, you would. Until we change the fundamental system to move towards greater equity, we are going to have a permanent class of people who are transitioning from shelter to an apartment, to homelessness again, to the streets, to, um, to shelter, to psychiatric hospitals, to jail and prison. Um, and the only way to end this is to create stable communities with stable housing where people get the support that they need in the place that they live. This is my daughter, Ariel. She's three years old. I was living in the shelter system when my daughter was inside of me. You feel like an animal there. You gotta come back just to sign in. I don't want no single mother going through that at all because it's horrible. Experience to be in a shelter by yourself and to be alone. We work with people with rental assistance vouchers of any type. In order to be eligible for the voucher, you have to be in the shelter for at least 90 days and also hit the other qualifying criteria. Almost all vouchers are meant to be used in the private market. They should be the same as cash, essentially. Many people spend months and months, some people years, looking for an apartment with their, with their voucher. Once you call and say, I'm interested in the, you know, I'm interested in this apartment, once they find out you have a voucher, you're either blatantly told straight out, like, we don't take vouchers, which is illegal, or what's really becoming more prevalent is um, this thing called ghosting, where once they find out you have a voucher, you just never hear back. In New York City, they used to have a whole unit dedicated to this issue 
um, and they helped so many people get access to housing after they were discriminated against. So right now their unit has been essentially like gutted, you know, and there's just not enough people there to help. I called someone else and they said, I said I was interested in an apartment. Um, they, they were so interested in Toy State that I have a voucher. This is JLS Realty, 33 Sherman Avenue. I had a meeting with you, I think? Yes, Roberto. Yes, yes I have my voucher. Right now, like, I can't really do much for you, to be honest. Even with the voucher, I still have to qualify you. I still need to see your pay stubs and still need to see all the requirements that are needed. But being that I have a voucher, I, ha I go under different qualifications. It's not the same qualifications for voucher holders. My job is to get a tenant for the landlord that qualifies with the qualifications. Am I going to keep content them every day? But that is income discrimination. That's not, that's not me that's doing it. Yes, I understand. Okay, but you should have told me this on the phone so I could have told you how the process works for you. You know I, mean? I could have told you that. Like, Thank you for your time. No Enjoy the rest of your day, Roberto. You know, I think there's so much of this idea that, like, if someone becomes homeless, it's their fault. And I think if you know much about the system at all, then it becomes really clear that, like, the system sets people up to fail. It's not a personal failure. It's not, like, a moral shortcoming. It's it's a policy failure, really. You're only one small disaster away from homelessness in New York City. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people teetering on the edge every day. This is my daughter, Jenny, and we are now living in a shelter in Brooklyn. My ultimate goal is really to get out the shelter, have a stable home for my daughter so I could, you know, establish myself. But I don't know anyone here. It's just me and my daughter. And I kind of like it that way. He just started becoming like abusive. It started verbally and then it, you know, progressed. I kept trying to justify it because I'm like, I don't have nowhere to go. And what, what am I going to do with my daughter? Despite being in the shelter, we're happy. I mean, we don't have like everything, but we're very like, we're good with the little bit of stuff that we have. Um, and I'm like pretty sure this is something she's gonna like grow up with. She's gonna grow up with being humble and it's okay not to have everything that everyone else has is because deep down inside, we're happy, we're happy. Hello. Hello, good evening. I'm calling to see if you guys have any availability for voucher holders. Okay, okay. For me, the biggest challenge to getting out of the shelter is actually finding a landlord that willing to accept the voucher. Honey, I know I'm gonna get out the shelter one way or another, even if it's with the voucher or without, but I'm definitely gonna do it. Hello, my name is Tavleen Tarrant. And I'm Shakiba Sohar. And we are the co-creators of our film called Soliciting Samaritans. This documentary follows the advocacy efforts of sex workers as they fight to get protection from the police in New York City. Hope you enjoy it. One night I went out and I met this white guy and he got me in the car. And he kind of like went and parked on a side street and pulled his penis out. And when he took out his penis, all of a sudden, um, the his friends, the, the other undercover cops came and locked me up. I was so intimidated by the cops at that time. 
I gave him fellatio because I was scared to go into jail. I had almost like 50 arrests uh, related to sex work. Black trans sex workers have historically been targeted the most for prostitution. According to the National Transgender Discrimination Survey, their arrest rate is 65%, which is the highest among any other racial and gender groups. I had a very privileged lifestyle. My mom made sure me and my brother had everything. Back when I was younger, I met an older trans woman on the strip in Manhattan, 14th Street. And she told me, she said, Carrie, if you're gonna be a trans woman, you're, you're never gonna be accepted in society. I took what she said seriously, and that's why I never tried to find a job. And that's why I stayed doing sex work. I had a choice between sex work and going to a nine to five or a traditional workspace and being misgendered, um, being made to feel inadequate. So what sex work offered for me was an opportunity to be in an environment where I was treated with a little bit more respect. Right here, Greenwich and Christopher, this is like the beginning of where the stroll starts. I used to get here at 10, 10 p.m. And then I used to leave sometimes at 8 a.m. or 9 a.m. in the morning. Back in the days, like when they used to arrest the girls, it was about numbers, about how many girls they could lock up in a night. We didn't always come out here to do sex work. The cops would see me and they would target me just for wearing a sexy outfit and being trans. I noticed like a lot of the white trans women, they wouldn't lock them up at all. But I noticed when it came to the black trans women, they used to always pick on us, lock us up. Since trans sex workers have a higher chance of being arrested, they fear the police, even when they need to report a crime. The National Transgender Discrimination Survey estimates that 58% of them are not comfortable with seeking help from the police. According to Jay Lee, a trans sex worker in New York, approaching the police comes with a lot of anxiety, as anything you report can invite further scrutiny into your past and come back to haunt you. The reality is that every single client could be a police officer, right? So you live with this low-level anxiety at all times. You know, you could be deported, you could lose your children, you could be incarcerated, you could be um, jailed in uh, the wrong uh, jail for your gender identity. With no protection from the police, transgender people are more vulnerable to violent attacks. In 2019, 25 trans people were murdered making it the deadliest year for transgender people in the U.S. But then, 2020 was worse. And 2021, worse than that, with 57 reported murders. According to a report by the Human Rights Commission, engagement in sex work puts trans people at a higher risk of violence. The state of New York has proposed a new bill that would give sex workers immunity from getting arrested if they report a crime. Sometimes referred to as the Good Samaritan Protection, the bill was first introduced by Assemblymember Richard Gottfried in 2019. However, it has yet to be brought up for debate and put to vote. Unfortunately, it's probably not a very high priority on a lot of people's lists. Legislators uh, have a lot of constituent concerns other than those of sex workers. Uh, who tend not to be a, uh, a very politically uh, uh, strong uh, constituency. Sex workers, including Jay Lee, are now organizing to raise public awareness of their struggles. On International Women's Day, they organized a rally in the Washington Square Park in the hopes of getting more attention on the immunity bill. Thank you for being here and um Sex workers' rights are human rights. Our labor is really important, and where a lot of times we're left out of feminist circles. 
so it's really important for us to be in these spaces. And in New York State, not only are we trying to decriminalize sex work, but we're also working towards an immunity bill in New York State. Um, we have, that's right. If we, if we decide to engage with law enforcement, if, big if, we need to be able to do that with immunity. Our clients can be able to do that with immunity. So great response, actually. Like it felt like a rally. I, I don't, I don't know that we thought it was going to be that much of a rally, but it did feel that way. I feel like people were really, really involved. Right? Yeah. Kiara James, a trans right advocate and a former sex worker, leads the New York Transgender Advocacy Group, a trans led organization commonly known as NITAG. At this photo shoot in Queens, NITAG is putting together a calendar featuring black trans sex workers. Usually, when people talk about black trans women, it's connected to violence and death. And so, this is really about um, exuding joy, you know. Um, just really showing the other side, the beauty of transness and black transness. Where, but um, within a year span in New York City, nine black trans women were murdered and there was silence from all the other organizations. Uh, we need to not rescue sex workers, but protect them, um, give them agency and autonomy over their bodies. <laughs> That freeze, I'm and I was just getting yeah, a little yeah, warm. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> we put you back again. They should give the girls immunity, cause but it's their bodies. Uh, nobody should be policing a trans woman body or anybody that's in sex work body. This year, the New York State is electing new legislators. Meaning, if the immunity bill does not get passed by June, it will expire with the current legislative session. The view of legislators on this issue is probably more or less similar to the view of the general population. And again, there are also people who say, you know, why should we be giving immunity from criminal prosecution to, to anybody uh, who has committed a crime? We need more bodies in the struggle at the back of this march. And if, the, and if the, those constituents don't put pressure on those senators, they won't do anything. And so all of you who participated in the photo shoot, that's part of what I want to show to the world, that we are the gift to the world and we need to be respected invested in, and most importantly, protected. So, Ashe, Ashe. Invest in black women of trans experience. Invest in black women of trans experience. Protect black women of trans experience. Protect black women of trans experience. I like this candle to guide home all the ancestors who have transitioned this world today. Amen, a woman, Lelem Lela. I wanted to memorialize my sisters who were passing while they were engaging in sex work. There's power to the people. And there's a picture of Marsha P. Johnson, who was a sex worker. Then there was um, Lady Godiva. I made her body positive. My art um, provides an opportunity to have a conversation about things that we've traditionally shamed, things that we've traditionally criminalized, things that we've traditionally placed stigma upon. Sex work is the oldest profession known to our species. <laughs> so if the immunity bill is passed, there will definitely have to be a training <laughs> for the police. They need to understand 
that they're not doing us a favor by treating us like humans. <laughs> It's important to continue this fight because we're not where we need to be at. We need to feel safer. We need to feel better. We need more legislation. We need more. We need more. Trans women and sex workers, we need more. And we're not going to stop. I'm Devin and I'm Lauren. Thank you so much for watching DogFest. Our documentary is about the families that were displaced following the Twin Parks fire in the Bronx in January. Baby books are gone. Photos gone. Diplomas gone. You know the, the painting that he, they did in kindergarten. The you know little things you do you don't realize how much you care about stuff until they're gone you know like my little teddy bear on my nightstand i kind of want to see i want to look at my bear every day it's gone like to lose everything you own in the world in one shot is almost unfathomable <laughs> Seventeen people dead, more than sixty injured in an apartment fire in the Bronx Sunday. It's the deadliest fire in New York City since 1990. Investigators blaming a faulty space heater. Notice smoke coming inside the door, black smoke, and then I just heard people say, um, screaming, "Help! Help! Help!" I spoke to half a dozen tenants today who say they've been staying at hotels since the fire. They want to know when they can get back home or get into a new place, but they say the help has been too slow. After the 333 Twin Parks fire in the Bronx, the city and the Red Cross placed families in hotels using city-funded vouchers. Families were told that they could stay until the fire department assessed the damage. But soon after, fire marshals told over 200 people that they couldn't return. Nikki Campbell and her family of seven are among the displaced. Her apartment was on the third floor, next door to where the fire started. But days have turned into weeks and then months. It's been over 100 days, and families like Nikki's are still staying in these hotels. So we literally left with nothing. We were left with nothing. We had whatever was on our backs, and I mean, nothing. Um, that was the hardest part. This is an example of a one-bedroom in the hotel. Imagine two beds in here, and Nikki and her six family members sharing two hotel rooms with two to each bed. Since there's no refrigerator or microwave in the room, catering companies in the area have been providing to-go meals for the families. The food has a habit of sitting there for a certain amount of time and starts to smell because it's going bad. Food that was just cooked an hour ago shouldn't start to smell spoiled in two hours. So that's a concern of ours. We've made, we've called the Bronx Borough President's office. We've sent emails, and we're always ignored. We've, I haven't had a response back yet, and I know many of my co-tenants have not been responded back to as well. All we want to do is be treated like people. You know, you wouldn't pay a catering service to feed your family, and you got garbage. Why is it okay to feed garbage to me and my family? Nikki and many others are trying to find a new apartment, but it's challenging. She needs a place that can fit her large family and qualify as Section 8 housing. Section 8 is a program through the city that provides housing vouchers to low-income families. Through this program, families typically pay no more than 40% of their monthly income towards housing. Jeffrey Schlegelmilch is the director for the National Center on Disaster Preparedness at Columbia Climate School. He oversees operations and strategic planning and has worked on efforts for disasters such as Hurricane Katrina. So much of response, so much of need, so much of a community's vulnerability and their capacity to cope with the disaster is defined through educational policy, economic development policy, housing policy. All of these things that seemingly have nothing to do with disasters have everything to do with who is disproportionately affected from disasters. 
Community organizations like the Gambian Youth Organization and the Muslim Community Network have held donation drives and given small checks to fire survivors. Also, according to the mayor's office, $3 million from the mayor's fund was supposed to be distributed to families through the nonprofit Bronx Works. But tenants are questioning how all of this money is being used. Some households have received $2,250, but this is not enough for large families to move into a new home and replace all of the items they lost in the fire. An important thing across all disaster assistance is it's never designed to make you whole again after a disaster. Um, it's just meant to create a floor to keep from falling too far behind. Also, current hotel bills for a one-bedroom are $4,340, almost double the rent price for the apartments in 333. Families can't help but wonder why they are still staying in hotels if there's enough money to place them in new homes. So today, we have some great leaders here. So many families are here who have been affected even through the fire in the Bronx. As people like Nikki continue searching for permanent housing, the deadline for the expiration of the hotel vouchers is approaching. Families have been told that the voucher will end on June 7th. Each month, these vouchers have been renewed, but families have not typically found out until the days leading up. Right now, all these families can do is wait to see what happens. You have to keep reminding yourself that it's going to be better, that you can handle it, you got this, and you're going to make it through here. And then I have to take that strength and pour it onto my children to keep them going and keep them doing the right thing and keep them uplifted. Because if they fall, I fall, and then if, we, if I don't stand tall, there's nobody to help, you know, it's just, it's just us. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. My name is Sumaya Filali and you're about to watch my film, Home But Away, which talks about the alarming increase in the number of mothers who are incarcerated and the challenges they face after release while trying to build their lives back and reunite with their children. I would like to thank Rebecca Wood for allowing me to tell her story, New Hour for taking the time to explain the issue, my classmates for their feedback, and our professors, Julian and Du, for not making it easy at all throughout. Thank you for joining and hope you enjoy. All my stuff is like everywhere because like I'm barely home. So it's like I'm always like going in different areas trying to find stuff. I was a lot more organized I feel like when I first got out, but then so now it's like everywhere. This will just wear this today. surreal like it kind of feels fake kind of like some mornings I still wake up like like jumpy you know like oh my god am I in a cell sometimes I still can't believe that I even did time like it's like oh I didn't even leave and other times it's like no I was gone like I feel it you know like right now when I'm working it's like I feel like I never left but then when I'm with my kids it's like yeah I, I left like I was gone for a while like my daughter's big my sons are older they're in sports, they're in preschool, like, they were babies when I left, so. I don't believe that there's enough focus on justice um, impacted women. I know that oftentimes there tends to be a bit more focus on the men. New Hour is a nonprofit organization based in Brentwood, New York, 
and we're an agency that supports uh, formerly incarcerated and justice impacted women and their children. On Long Island, we're the only ones that specifically focus on uh, formerly incarcerated women and their children. It's so important to have uh, gender specific and trauma informed programs. The needs of women are so specific and so different than men. Nine out of 10 of our women are survivors of abuse. That includes physical, sexual, um, childhood abuse. A lot of our women are survivors of human trafficking. A lot of our women are mothers as well. They do have CPS involvement and need assistance in navigating you know, things like family court. Housing not only for them, but for their children as well. Yesterday I didn't go to my son's soccer because I didn't have a supervisor, so I even called CPS. I begged her, like, listen, my parents can't go. Can I just go just to have, just to watch him? And she says, if the super's not there, you're not allowed. And I cried, you know, like I felt terrible because I hadn't missed one game yet. My son, he tries extra hard when I'm there, like, because he wants to, like, make me proud and it's, like, sad because I don't care, like he cried when he didn't score. And I'm like, you don't have to cry. Like, it's okay to like not score, you know? So sad. He was like, but mom, yeah, I need to score for you. Like, you don't have to score for me, baby. Like, it's okay if you don't score. It's sad that I can't be with him. You're looking at a mom whose children are maybe in someone else's custody, if there is CPS involvement, then that only extends uh, that time that she goes without having her children back because there may be certain mandates that she needs to meet. And oftentimes those mandates will include stable housing for you and your children, employment, the completion of certain programs. I'm driving people and like tips are like the most important thing. Um, and like if my clients think I'm like a bum, they're not going to want to give me a tip, you know? And like every tip I get is towards like closer to like getting my kids or closer to getting an apartment. And you got to look professional. As professional as I can be anyway. Okay. Just make sure everything's good. My wallet. What? bothered me most about coming out of prison too was jobs. I applied to maybe over 900 jobs and they maybe 15 or 20 called back and once they found out I had a felony they all denied it. If a woman has a felony on their record employment tends to be that much more difficult any sort of felony uh, tends to bar a lot of our women from a lot of employment opportunities. That has a huge impact on their reentry because if you don't have um, a reliable source of income, not much can come from that, right? You're limited in where you, where you can now live, the things that you can now purchase for yourself or for your children. So for us, having stable employment and having stable housing is the foundation for a successful re-entry. So I'm like, all right, let me try cab services. I called limousine places, chauffeur, and they all said, no, I have a felony. So then I go to this company, and this company, I didn't tell them I had a felony. I felt bad. I didn't lie, but I didn't tell them. And when he was like, go train, I'm like, listen, you guys hire felons. Like, I had to be honest. And he was like, I'm a felon. I'm like, you are? Like, and I smile. He's like, why are you smiling? That's not cool. I'm like, because, like, and I start crying. I'm like, because I need a job. I just got out of jail. And, and that's when I told my boss a majority of what's going on. And um, he gave me the shot, you know. So me being on time is important to me. Me doing what I'm supposed to do is important to me for this job because he gave me that opportunity. And I make the most money out of all the drivers here. I make more money than anyone. Oh, I forgot. I got to text my boss and let him know I have parent game today. I've missed parenting probably about twice because of work or um, my kids. But now that like I'm so serious about my kids, I don't care. Like I'll lose my job over 
not going, you know, like I'm gonna go. I need this for my kids. If I don't do this now, I'm never gonna do it, so. Today I got parenting, so I have to leave at 4.30, so he's not gonna be too happy about me leaving work an hour and a half earlier. Alexander, he, he's been crying a lot because he says to me, Mommy, after the visit, I'm leaving, and then Alexander did cry. He goes, Mommy, can we just stay in your car? Aww. I'm like, baby, you, it's cold. We can't stay in my car. He's like, Mommy, I don't care. I just want to live with you. We'll live in the car. We can go park over there. I'm Aww. like, Alexander, we're not parking in the parking lot. Like, baby, we're going to get, remember I told you, like, I was a doctor and I'm home. My booby belly's gone. I said, so I told you I gotta come home, I need a job. And then we get a house. He's like, okay, so no job yet? I said, I have a job. Oh, you do? So now get a house. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, yes, but baby, it takes time. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, I'm waiting for CPS and the judge to say yes. I have to wait for approval, so it's like sad to like explain it to him, but. But you're yeah. making strides still. You're one step closer every time. Yeah, it's, it's hard. The most, most pressing need is housing. Uh, housing on Long Island is especially difficult to, to find for mothers and for formerly incarcerated women in general. And then when we look at rentals, the prices are astronomical and way out of um, budget for a lot of our members. Hey, what's up? I'm at the um, Gulf gas station getting gas. Um, there's a girl here. She wants to know if I can give her um, a ride from here to St. James. She said 473-25A, I texted it to you. I don't know if you got the text. So this week, I'm gonna make about a thousand. Every week, I should be making close to $1,700. And I'm trying to get other clients to like transfer to me so I can make more money a week, you know? Cause this is gonna help like get like an apartment for my kids and like basically like afford to live in Long Island. Like, the money that I'd be making if I get clients in the car is, is really gonna help a lot with the kids. Driving gets very tiring. I'd be like very sleepy driving, trying to like stay awake while I'm driving because it gets dangerous sometimes. Gotta keep myself awake because I'm only sleeping like three, four hours a night. I go home and I gotta get home, pick up my mom, go straight to the kids, or go home, do group for an hour. During group, I'm falling asleep because I'm not driving. I'm just sitting there doing nothing. And then my my counselor takes me off with a Zoom video because it looks like I'm nodding out. And like it's like, oh, that's a trigger for other addicts. Like, it looks like you're high. And I'm like, I'm not freaking high. Like, I'm not high. I'm just tired, like physically exhausted. Like I did all this work and I'm tired. I drink the energy drinks because if I don't, I'll be so tired and shot that it's like, what am I gonna do if I fall asleep? So the monster gives me that energy, like I'll drink it slowly within like an hour so that I get like that energy for like three hours. I feel bad a lot of the times because I can't remember everything I have to do every day. Like some days um, I have parenting, some days I have outpatient, some days I have soccer and baseball. Like let's say outpatient. I'll remember, I'll get the text that remind me at one, like, oh, here's the code for, for Zoom at six. And then 545 come and I'll forget and I'll miss. And then I feel so bad because it's like, one, I missed an appointment. Two, it's part of my children. Like, if I miss that, it's like I'm missing them because I can't get them back without having that. Where did I put the frickin' binder? My mind is so everywhere with coming out and working and getting on a schedule that, you know, it's very hard to remember everything.
generational things in your family that maybe you want to change or do differently? Like, is there a way that you Addiction. were raised? Right, okay. Like, every other, no. every, every generation is somebody who's an addict. Every freaking generation. Mm. Like, my grandma's grandma was an addict, and then her son was, and then my, my grandma, um, her brother was, and then her son was. Mm -hmm. And then my dad wasn't, but then his two kids were. You know, okay. I break that. I mean, it's kind of like generational, but yeah, it, is. it could happen. It is. I just want to leave something that, like, basically, like, my kids could remember forever. Like, mommy did jail time, came out, and within, let's say, six months, she got a job, apartment, a house, got mm -hmm. us back. Like, you know, doesn't touch drugs, yeah. just doing the right thing. That's, like, the legacy I want for okay. my kids. Just knowing I was coming to court is very nerve wracking because like, I just did two years in jail, you know? And I've lost them already for that long. So knowing I have court and I have a dirty was nerve wracking because number one, I don't wanna go back to jail for anything. Number two, if I lose time with them, I don't even, I don't even have enough time now. So I did a hair follicle because I had a dirty urine they wanted to make sure that I wasn't using. They took about maybe like this much hair, but they take sections, this much and this much. They do three, three, three. So I have three bald spots now that they cut it. I come back up to court and the judge says, look, I'm gonna keep everything how it is at the moment. So my four, I get four visits a week, two hours a day. And then I said to the judge, I said, listen, your honor, like I need, um, health records so I can go to the doctors with them and I also need academics so I can go pick them up for school or find out their school stuff and be able to talk to their teachers so the judge um, granted me that so I have that that's very good I'm very confident that this hair follicle test will come back perfect because you know I, I didn't use the drug so if I lost visits with them like it would be so bad to the point where my kids would have a mental, make a mental breakdown. I, I believe that because my oldest is very sad about it. Like, mommy, I miss you. Mommy, can I just come home? Can we live in the car together? I need two mommies, a statue mommy of you and a real life mommy. And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, I need two mommies, a statue of you and a real mommy that comes home. Once I complete outpatient, CPS should be out of my life. Parenting I should be completing if not this Tuesday the following Tuesday because I was late again yesterday for parenting um, Because of work and I can move in with the kids. I'm hoping by June. I can move in with them July the latest get an apartment and have my son in kindergarten Me and my uh, fiance were um, about to go to sleep, actually, they could take a nap or whatever. It was like, I think nine o'clock. And luckily we didn't take a nap because there was like some sound coming out. We were watching TV, pretty, the TV was pretty loud, so we didn't really hear anything. But her ears were really, uh, were better than mine, I guess. And she was like, what, what is that sound? And I was like, that's probably the air or, or some pipes. We went out to the kitchen and it was gushing. The, the water was just gushing in like the Titanic from the, the backyard door. And then we heard uh, gushing water from the bathroom. The, the, the toilet was gushing water. And we looked down to the, uh, the boiler room and water was shooting out from the floor. Within like 10, 15 minutes, the water was like a foot. So it's really tough. Yep, yep, thinking about it, you know, it's like 
you know, I don't know, sort of painful, painful, painful memories actually. Lost a bunch of animals and um, yeah, lost, lost almost everything we had. On August 29, 2021, Hurricane Ida hit the United States. It was the second most damaging hurricane on record, and it left behind a trail of destruction. By September 1st, the hurricane had made its way from Louisiana, where it made landfall, to several cities in the Northeast, including New York. The city saw subways submerged, roads flooded, and even houses destroyed. In the aftermath, an unexpected form of casualty was discovered, basement housing. The rain flooded these illegal apartments, and 11 of the 13 people who died were in their basement homes. The 2022 Atlantic hurricane season is just one month away, and it's supposed to be more active than usual. We foresee that a hurricane season is going to be more active when the climate models that are run to predict it identify that there's going to be a higher number of named storms and hurricanes than average. The problem is urgent um, because it's not going to stop and it's not going to get better. One thing that I'm increasingly tracking is accidental deaths that are a little more surprising than your typical traffic crash or fire. They're accidental deaths that are driven by climate change. And so what we're talking about here is not, you know, the accident as we've long perceived it, but a rise in the way that climate change affects our built environment, our very fragile, very accident-prone built environment that puts people at risk. And it doesn't just put everyone at risk it puts certain people more at risk because who's most likely to be living in a basement apartment in New York City? It's people living in poverty. That's who dies. I'm a magician actually by trade. After uh, the hurricane, yeah, I, I've been taking um, you know, more jobs and stuff like that. It doesn't matter if it's uh, you know, not up to par from what I'm usually making and stuff like that. I just had to because you know, it's, it's a tough economy out there and especially I had to make back everything that, I, that, that I've lost. It was uh, over $50,000 worth of stuff. This stuff is new, um, you know, stuff for my, uh, my act. This is a, uh, a milk uh, kind of uh, a milk uh, man, uh, trick. And I have uh, this, some kind of mind reading trick, but I don't want to show you guys the secrets. All these, um, all this secrets of magic, yeah. Yep, so half uh, salvaged and half, uh, half new. It's difficult to know exactly how many, but some estimates are 198, 200,000 uh, basement apartments many of them concentrated in uh, immigrant sections of Queens, Jackson Heights, also the Rockaways in Brooklyn, but it's a very large number. New York's basement apartments are occupied by immigrants. South Asian, Latin American, Southeast Asian. It's a combination of a range of immigrant groups from countries around the world. Amit Shiv Prasad is an Indo-Guyanese immigrant. His family moved here when he was in the seventh grade. Their first home was a basement apartment. Now they own a house in Hollis, Queens. For the last 14 years, a Trinidadian family rented their basement. But when Ida struck, two members of that family died. Back about 14 or 15 years ago, I used to work at a grocery store. Our boss was very very, very nice, very kind to us. And he had mentioned to me that, hey, we have um, a family who just migrated and they were looking for a place to stay. And, you know, we never ever, ever rented our basement before or gave it to anyone to stay. And, and he went and the owner of the grocery store asked my dad, hey, would you be, do us a favor and just have these folks stay here for a little while? And he says, okay, we'll just do it temporarily, not knowing that 15 years later, unfortunately, they will still be here and, 
you know, due to circumstances, my dad did go down twice and tell him to come up because of the rain and the amount and that stuff. But due to the amount of water and the weak infrastructure in this area, we had two lives lost. And it's very, very sad. And, you know, it's something you're never going to forget. In New York, as in every city, there are building codes. Building codes dictate the requirement for there to be two means of egress, two ways to get out. So if one of those ways to get out is through a window and the other way is up some stairs and there's not an easy door that just goes outside because you're in the basement, the outside stairs might block something like that, well, that's not a legal structure. It's not a legal place to live. So basement apartments typically violate the letter of building code laws. People choose to live there because it's better than living on the street. Uh, basement uh, apartment started off at $1,000 when I moved in in Elmhurst and regular apartment right now is 1800 so it's a big it's a big difference yeah and that was two bedroom which actually became a three bedroom because we took over the whole basement and this is only one bedroom for 1800 yeah and that one came you know with uh you know a uh, gas and everything and this one i've got to pay extra gas electric so it's a, mm -hmm. it's a big saving yeah it's almost like half price New York's public housing is facing a shortage crisis. It is underutilized because families often live in apartments that have more bedrooms than they need. At the same time, the average length of stay for nearly half of the households has been 20 years. And 181,000 families are still on the wait list. So when new immigrants come to the city, public housing usually isn't an option and neither is the expensive private market. So they turn to basements. Segundo Quinzo is an Ecuadorian immigrant who came to America 16 years ago. He has lived in his basement apartment in Queens for 11 years. Yo vivo con mis hijos y eh, claro que ha sido muy difícil, pero no hay de otra. Como nosotros somos migrantes, nos buscamos más económico y la eh, este país que nos gana no nos alcanza. Although his apartment did not flood during Ida, he has a pump ready in case the next season does not favor him as much. One thing that's important to look at when we talk about accidents is there's an urge to, to blame the last person who made a mistake, to blame individual bad actors. Um, well, what we're looking here is systemic problems. So, you know, one landlord renting out a dangerous basement apartment to another person who desperately needs a place to live um, isn't a good equation for anyone, but it is the result of a catastrophic housing shortage in New York City. So the infrastructure, um, how we pay for our roads and our homes, how we uh, build out our built environment and also build out our social safety net so that people have the resources to survive. We applied for uh, FEMA and I think some funds from uh, Red Cross, and we did get some money from both. I think it was like under $1,000 for, for both of them. But I, the main thing was um, I actually had a GoFundMe, which helped me out. The Magic community actually came through for me like, big time. I'm talking about my customers, uh, my friends that are entertainers, like magicians, clowns, jugglers, they all came through and everybody donated. And that's how we got back on our feet because even the hotel fees are like a couple of thousand dollars for the for the about a, about a month we were like homeless basically. This is actually the emergency shortage we were talking about earlier, due to the wall being due to the wall collapse and missing off the foundation. Um, this is what's called emergency shortage. Um, it's waterproof right now. Um, pretty much, it's all blocking the whole enclosure from the wall that's missing. And this all needs to be replaced. This entire, from that step all the way down to the front will be replaced as part of the permanent work. So it's all blocked by sandbags just to make sure no water um, penetrates into the, the creases or the bottom of the, 
of the emergency enclosure right now. So right now we're still at the apartment um, paying the rent, working on different steps to get the house rebuilt and refixed. But there's a lot of, a lot of paperwork, like I said, there's a lot of DOB documents you have to submit. There's a lot of reports. There's a lot of um, documentations. Whereas keep in mind this, when this all happened in September, we were given words, oh, we'll have everybody come out and work with you guys and make sure everything that you need to get done, done back and get done and, and be done instantly. At this nine months already, we haven't seen one person come back out here and said, oh, how can we help this community speed up this rebuilding process and fix what the damages are? So we're still waiting. Amit now needs to borrow $200,000 from SBA's disaster loan program to fix the base of his house. His family cannot live there until then. He's written to several government officials asking them to come take a look at the infrastructure in their flood-prone neighborhood. Hollis was one of the sites under a project replacing sewer and water mains, which was completed last June. But this did not prevent the flooding. The neighborhood, which is built in a basin atop a pond, has flooded for years. And now, a government plan prioritizing certain neighborhoods might exclude the area. According to the 2019 Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, 35% of the statewide spending on clean and energy efficiency programs will be allocated to neighborhoods identified as disadvantaged. The government recently came out with a preliminary map of these neighborhoods. Hollis isn't one of them. And residents are worried about the future. The first step is we all move our vehicles from the street and we either put it up the block or straight go up to Jamaica Avenue onto a higher ground. The second of all, we'll all get our ponchos on. Um, gonna get some brooms, shovels, a, um, a pitchfork, and we'll be outside cleaning those man manholes and the catch basins to make sure there's nothing obstructing the water from going down. We're risking our life in the middle of a, with, a heart, with a lightning and rainstorm, cleaning where our city officials from DEP or anyone does not even come out and clean these basins. In summer 2021, three storms hit New York City in a span of six to eight weeks and caused major flooding. The first was Elsa, the second was Henry, and the third was Ida. In, in each of those events, um, the record for maximum precipitation was broken. Um, and that by the time that Ida reached New York City, it had only been roughly 10 days that Henry had left. It's very certain to me that situations like Ida may happen more often. Green infrastructure uses ecology to manage stormwater. Planted areas like rain gardens on sidewalks allow water to seep into the soil and thus prevent the street from flooding. But their effectiveness can be questioned during heavy events like Ida. And because of that, it's very important that we are very certain about what the actual performance of the interventions that we want to incorporate is and combine it with other, you know, um, ambitious infrastructural projects such as big water tanks um, that will be able to store rainwater much faster. New York City as a whole uh, needs to engage, and it is engaging, it we're going to call infrastructure aiming toward resilience, the, the ability to uh, keep rising waters out of the city through seawalls, through other measures. Uh, at the same time, in the near term, there has to be a system, whether it's through cell phones or whatever, to provide warning, get out, water is rising, you could die. And so the city needs to engage in that kind of early warning system for the residents of basement apartments. Our entire neighborhood here was completely devastated. There's a lot of damages to properties, foundation damages, structural damages. We're just worried about what happens when the next rainstorm comes back. Mm -hmm.